All right, uh, if you wanna go back to the YouTube videos and uh, um, you know review things, but uh, I guess, like I said, this is my early Christmas gift to you for everybody, okay? So, uh, first topic is uh, the headings on the returns. Uh, basically, focus on the main info. Um, a few of you, the notes that I sent back on the midterm, um, I did talk to you about the fact that I wanted you to focus on the, the main info. Um, things are on there, you know, the importance of getting the uh, dependents and all the credits that they have there checked correctly, um, making sure that you're finishing up and doing the uh, direct deposit, uh, the bank account information. So if they want to do their refund or their payment electronically, that we have that on the main info. And first and foremost, and I think I sent in a couple notes, and I mentioned last week when we reviewed the midterm, um, make sure that you put your preparer name at the bottom. Just like your first grade teacher used to remind you to write your name on the paper, uh, we need to know who it is. And so when, when we're doing some of this online with um, the uh, returns, you know, some of the returns as I would print them out so that I could grade them, I discovered that I did not have a name on the paper. So, you know, in the spirit of your first grade teacher, make sure that you do that, okay? Uh, we're gonna have some W-2 wages. So kind of review your W-2 wages, okay? Uh, we're gonna have some self-employment or business income. So self-employment and business income. So focus on those. Uh, we did those, a lot of those last week. Um, so make sure that you're focusing on that. Uh, you know, we'll have some things with that and I'm sure you know, as, as much as we may begrudge it, we're gonna have some depreciation on there, okay? Um, we're gonna have a couple adjustments to income. Uh, pretty straightforward ones, but adjustments to income. So those lines at the bottom of page one of that 1040, make sure you focus on your adjustments to income. You know, if we have, uh, I'm sure if we have self-employment and there's a, uh, uh, profit on our Schedule C that we're going to see that self-employment tax there, okay? Um, itemized deductions or standard deductions, okay? I'm sure that, uh, again, we're going to do some things on a Schedule A, I guess for my hint, so make sure you understand your Schedule A. Um, I know from the midterm, the big thing I want everybody to focus on is where that interest goes, okay? Interest income, Schedule B, all right? Interest expense, Schedule A. Okay, so make sure we remember that, okay? All right, uh, let's see, so we had that. Um, we'll have some tax. Um, I'm sure that, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you know, our family's name is Demick, and I'm sure the Demicks are gonna have a college student. All right, so make sure you remember to review your education credits. Make sure you remember to review education credits. That being said, not all the kids are in college, so I bet we're gonna have some child tax credit too, okay? Um, their business that they have, they are going to be successful. So I'm sure they're gonna have some self-employment tax, all right? And last but not least, and the thing that we'll cover today, they uh, um, have decided to uh, invest in a rental property. They're going to have rental income, all right? So those are the, the areas of uh, what we've covered that I want you to focus on. I know we, you know, the textbook, obviously there, there's a lot in the textbook. There's a lot of topics. Um, again, the textbook for you can be a great reference book, just like you'll have in your office with what they call quick finders um, or tax books that are kind of abridged, 77,000 pages of the tax law abridged into a little bit of a desktop version. But uh, so you'll have that. And, uh, but, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, we understand that, you know, the time that we have on Saturdays with this live and, and things like that, you know, there are certain topics that we focus on. Um, you can kind of see those from what I talk about on the lectures and what, uh, what's covered in the quizzes and the exercises. A lot of times there'll be extra things in there that, um, that we have that, uh, that are not as important. So, all right. And uh, for anybody that's just joining us, uh, make sure that you go back and uh, review uh, the uh, lecture. Maybe I'll go through it again at the end, uh, but we just talked about uh, what to prepare for the final, okay? Um, on the subject of the final, um, I like to try if I can, because this will be the only opportunity I have to really see you, and we at our new here corporate office on Niagara Falls Boulevard, excuse me, on Colvin Boulevard in Tonawanda, uh, we have a great learning center. So 
what I'd like to do, and I'll kind of send out uh, some uh, uh, ranges of times and dates uh, that I'd like to get you in here to do the final. Are you free to make an appointment? I'm okay. Um, I'd like to, um, um, you know, make sure that uh, um, we make the arrangements to try to get in here to be able to do, um, you know, the 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 final in person, if at all possible. Okay, I understand for some of you, and uh, as I, I said, I introduced Richard. I'll probably go to Florida to give Richard his final, so I can get out of the snowy weather. But uh, you know, for some of you that that it just logistically doesn't work, and when I send out the email regarding that, you know, just let me know so that uh, we can work out arrangements. Um, I realize this is an online class and such like that, and we'll probably still be able to do the final. Um, as we did kind of on a live uh, Zoom session. So um, I'll make a note to myself to make sure that I get that out to everybody today, okay? All right, um, that being said, um, again, you know, everybody's been doing great on the homework. Um, you know, I encourage you not only to view the uh, lectures that we record here, but the lectures that I do for the classroom sessions. Um, sometimes I'll work different problems depending on what I can find and I try to get as many different uh, tax wise problems so that you know I know there's a few of you that uh, are familiar with other softwares um, and have used other softwares and, and you know sometimes uh, you know getting a new software um, you guys are doing great understanding the law but sometimes getting that adaptation to translate into uh, putting it in tax wise to complete the return sometimes that's where we run into a little bit of a, a snag but Hopefully, uh, being able to watch the videos, you can kind of get a feel for the, the fact that we have that uh, uh, resource for you, okay? Um, let's see, do I have, oh, the other thing, admin-wise, uh, a lot of you, it's been great. I know I sent out a reminder email prior to today's class uh, just talking about the employment opportunity. Um, I have several of you that have already submitted uh, your work forms. Um, and or maybe have been uh, our district manager Marie Rickard might have reached out to some of you already um, regarding the the employment, but um, Just if you can make sure you get those availability to me um, We're trying to get everybody's uh, interviews so you, we can come in get the paperwork going for you get your scheduled for the interview um, And kind of taking a look at uh, where you what uh, all of our offices where you'd like to work So we want to make sure that you get that in as soon as possible Okay, so please, uh, you know, even if you plan not to work, uh, I know I've talked to a couple of you that have had situations where, you know, because of, of different things or, or, or the reason for you for taking the class that uh, you're not going to be working for us for the upcoming year. But, uh, you know, please, if, uh, if you could just let me know one way or the other, that would be great. So we can make planning and, and, and try to get you in here for uh, arrangements for you for an interview. Okay. All right, so we're going to kind of get into our material, okay? Um, the one thing that I am going to do, okay, is, now well, let's see here. My sheets here. <clears throat> okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The uh, exercises and the quiz, everybody did great on those to turn those in. So everything looks great. Um, I know there was a lot in there. Um, the one that I know of, uh, we talked about a little bit and I hope everybody uh, did well with was the, <coughs> and I kind of emphasized, excuse me, that I kind of emphasized was the uh, calculating a prior depreciation, okay? And uh, if you didn't like the fact that I assigned it to you this time, um, you're even going to like me less after today's lectures about rentals when I assign you depreciation for several years, prior depreciation for several years uh, for a rental that was purchased several years ago. So, but uh, it's important to have. Um, obviously, you know, if you've, you've done the, the homework, or excuse me, the workbook problems uh, with the uh, different problems in there that uh, you have to do depreciation, you know, it's it's obviously very nice. The, the little worksheet that we have in TaxWise really, you know, does a lot of it for you, uh, making sure that you select the correct asset type and, and the year placed in service and, and the convention and stuff. It does all the calculation. Um, the one thing it doesn't do 
it does not calculate for you prior depreciation. Um, so you have a client come to you that has a business with assets being depreciated and or rental that's being depreciated and uh, they come to you with uh, their tax return from a previous tax preparer and uh, you have to know that because as we're going to talk about today if that rental is sold we need to know what that prior depreciation is so that we can know what we have to recapture so it's very important that we make sure that we you know have our understanding of how to get that um, you know sometimes the the uh, copies of the returns will have some of that for you but if they don't have access to it or was not given to them or you know god forbid that the the previous preparer you know you know shut doors or um, passed on you know then we got to make sure that we know how to uh, figure out that prior depreciation form especially when it comes to the sale of a of an investment or rental property okay so make sure that we understand on that, and that was uh, really part of the, the chapter 14, those big exercises that were there, okay? Um, there was uh, the one tough problem we talked a little bit about, and I wanna make sure that kinda everybody understands. So I'm gonna go to that one. Uh, so give me a second here to get that up in front of me, or in front of us, I should say. And again, if any questions, um, you should have your chat that's down along the bottom there, and uh, you can pop some questions into there, um, you know, and, and uh, we can answer them as we go along. Um, you know, I know every once in a while I like to take a break, and I do give you the opportunity if you want to pop your mics open so I can hear your voices and, um, you know, know what's going on, that's great too, okay? All right, uh, the one that I'm looking at here is part of that 14A problem that we had. Um, it's down on page let's see here it starts out on 1418 but the one I want to take a look at is the one on page 1421 all right so the 1421 that's a problem and uh, this one was kind of a, a unique because it actually had to do depreciation had us do some special depreciation and uh, we also had a section 179 that we did on some property that was bought by our friend here mr. Bill Peterson um, as it talks about, he purchased $750,000 of uh, seven-year equipment for his business. Uh, three pieces, uh, come to find out, it's uh, printing presses, and they were each valued at $250,000, okay? Um, it kind of helps us with that. Um, it's kind of nice that they did uh, the way that they did um, for the um, uh, depreciation as far as making them of equal value. Um, you know, it does show that he purchased them in March, June, and October, but each one was of the same value. Uh, remember that the uh, example that we went through in the text, uh, we talked about that rental where somebody bought something that was more than 40% of the assets purchased, and they bought that in the fourth quarter, so that would make that a mid-quarter uh, convention. But in this case, uh, the writer of the problem was nice enough to make all three of them of the same value, so we're good there. Okay, all right, what we had to do is we had these three pieces and really what we were doing is we were gonna determine how much depreciation was gonna be taken in the tax year of 2017. And as you can see right there, it says that we want to fill in the worksheets and everything and we wanna know the section 179, we wanna know the special, and then we wanna know the total 2017, or excuse me, the 2017 depreciation and then the total depreciation that is taken, okay? So, we had to kind of break things down a little bit. Um, it gave us the little worksheets to do, okay? And uh, the 4562, but what I want you to note on there, and uh, you know, again, for some of you, you realize that there is the um, answer key uh, for the problems at the back of uh, the book we're in, of uh, the textbook, uh, volume two. But uh, what I want you to be aware of is that when we took that first press, we took it as a section 179, okay? It was, at, it was eligible, so we were able to take it as a section 179, okay? And that meant that we could take all $250,000 of that in the first part, okay? So that's where we took that, all right? Um, the second press, was again, section 179, okay? So we were able to take that. 
So obviously with the income, uh, when you see it says Bill's business income from the year was $10 million, you know, he has a pretty sizable uh, uh, income and probably after expenses still has a pretty sizable income that we want to manage his um, uh, depreciation. And again, when we talked about it, remember I kept trying to use the analogy of the pie. You know, our, our asset is our pie. We're going to cut it up and when are we going to eat it? We're going to eat it all the first year. We're going to eat it in future years. Are we going to eat it um, little slivers over the seven years? How are we going to eat our pie? Okay. That's really what depreciation is, is cutting up our pie. And in this case, he decided to eat two of the pies um, in the first year because it was $10 million because he was really hungry with that, okay? Now the third press, he did as special depreciation. So he took half of it, or $125,000, and he took half of it, and he also took the depreciation for that year. So remember, with special depreciation, really there's two things going on. You take that half of the asset that you're taking, plus you're also taking that first year's depreciation. In this case, it was $17,863, okay? So for this problem, uh, the 2017 total depreciation that was gonna be taken by uh, Bill for his three presses was $642,863, okay? So that was his total depreciation for that problem. And again, you know, I wanted to review this one because, you know, it's important to realize that when you have a client or somebody that has a business, and in this case, $10 million, um, very important that you try to match up his expenses or what's generating that income with, uh, with that income and match them up and, and try to manage his tax liability uh, through the uses of Section 179 and special allowance to make sure we can match up on his depreciation uh, to, to try to, like I said, manage his tax liability, okay? So that's really what I wanted to kind of focus on there. And again, as I said, you know, and kind of reviewing a little bit, you know, don't get hung up too much on the depreciation. Um, I realize it's a lot. Um, I realize that there is quite a bit there, um, you know, as far as all the different conventions and methods and, and things like that and all the tables with all the numbers and everything, it, it can be a lot but I want you to just kind of really reel it back in and simplify it and say, okay, here it is. I bought a pie. How am I going to cut my pie up? How am I going to eat it? You know, am I really hungry this year? Well, I'm going to eat the whole pie if I can, if, it'll, if somebody will let me. And that's where, you know, qualifying for the section 179 or, you know, my eyes are bigger than my stomach, so I'm only going to eat half of it. So I'm going to leave the other half for future years. And, and again, you know, uh, you know, basic depreciation, and the method that we use with makers, you know, I'm going to eat some of the pie, a little bit more next year, and then just a little bit till it's gone at the end of however many years that pie can be eaten. You know, in this case, it was seven. Okay. So that's really what I want to kind of focus on there. All right. All right. So we're going to get into rent rentals and royalties. Okay. So rents and royalties. All right. Um, this is, like I said, really kind of an extension of uh, <clears throat> what we had uh, in chapter 15 with the um, um, uh, business income, okay? So we have kind of an extension there of it. <clears throat> and uh, we're gonna talk about rental income and how it's handled. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, and, and royalties also. Um, so for those of you that uh, are out there that have intellectual property, I guess they call it, and things like that, uh, you know, if you're receiving royalties on it, or if anybody has some oil wells that they own, and they uh, just cash in on the oil wells, and doing taxes for EG tax has just become a hobby or a little side thing, um, we'll talk about the royalties and such like that, okay? All right, rental income, okay? So when you have a rental property, um, you know, we're gonna be, as I've kind of disclosed a little bit, we're gonna be on Schedule E. Um, that's where the rental and the, and the uh, royalties are, all right? And rental income can be generated from a variety of sources, from personal property, services provided to renters, real estate, and for different purposes, for profit and not for profit, okay? So again, you know, you can have those things that, uh, are such that, you know, rental doesn't have to be what we traditionally think of. I have a piece of property or I live in a double, um, you know, and I rent the other half, okay? 
you know, that's the basis of it, but there are circumstances that can be different in the way that we handle different things, okay? Now, one thing that, uh, you know, I emphasize to some of my clients and when I talk to them is when they tell me that they've bought a double or they, they have rental or it's a new client, you know, I make sure I talk to them and ask them those questions. Hey, are you really in the rental business for profit, okay? Um, are you really doing this so that you can, you know, make money? Um, or am I living in a double and I've decided to rent half of it to my brother-in-law um, who's on hard times, you know, and am I renting it below fair market value, okay? You know, if, if I'm not, you know, renting for profit, then as you can see in the section, the income's reported on the line 21, and then we do our expenses on our Schedule A, our 2%. But, you know, as we know, uh, and I've talked a little bit going along here, you know, that expense is being reported on the federal on the 2% uh, section. That 2% section's gone for 18. Um, they've taken that out of the Schedule A. But in the case of New York and many other states, they've, uh, you know, as Esther likes to say, they've divorced the IRS and the federal government. And being out on their own, they've decided that they're going to keep that 2%. So, you know, again, if somebody's in a situation where, you know, these rental activities that they have are not for profit, um, you know, they're just collecting a couple hundred bucks here and there and trying to pass it off as rental income and write off the expenses on a Schedule E, um, you know, we have to make sure that they understand that uh, they can still do that, but it's not going to be treated that way. It'll be income on line 21, expenses subject to the 2%, not on the federal, but quite possibly on the state like New York. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is rental income can come in many different, um, you know, avenues or, or states or, or ways that it looks, um, you know, these all following are called uh, gross rental income, you know, obviously rent collected, okay, including late payments and fees, advance rent if somebody pays ahead of time, um, expenses paid by a tenant uh, instead of doing rent, so the tenant pays the water bill and deducts the amount from their rental payment, that's still considered income. Uh, property or services received instead of rent, um, you know, the tenant pays the property instead of two months of rent. Again, that's still rental income, okay? Uh, payment to cancel a lease. Uh, security deposit is income, but only if it's kept and the tenant didn't live up to the lease terms. So really, most of the time when we have that, uh, that deposit, that security deposit, it's not realized income until um, it's not returned. You know, we usually hold it in escrow, okay? Uh, rental expenses. Um, again, rental expenses here. You know, we have all these things that are rental expenses. Like I said, some of these categories are going to look very familiar from what you saw on the Schedule C, advertising. Um, you know, did I put an uh, ad in the, the local newspaper to try to get this rented? Um, or, you know, did I advertise to have somebody be my, um, you know, snow removal and, and uh, lawn mowing, okay? Auto and travel, again, you know, if you're in this rental business, um, and you're making, you know, you have to go over and do the snow removal yourself or you're running to Home Depot or you have to drive over there to collect rent, things like that. That's, you know, mileage, okay? Uh, cleaning and maintenance, I kind of talked about a little bit. Um, you know, those are things that I like to have in there, um, you know, that talk about snow removal and, and uh, grass mowing and such. Um, insurance, again, if you have insurance on the property, and we're gonna talk about it when we do one of the uh, problems out of the workbook today, but remember in homeowner's insurance, this is one of the times you can deduct it. But if you're living in a double, you can only take half of it. You can't take the whole homeowner's insurance, only what uh, relates to the income property, okay? Uh, legal and professional fees, you know, again, if uh, you know, you're know you tax prepared, but if you have to evict somebody, that would be some legal fees. Uh, management fees, you know, sometimes people have rental property and maybe it's out of state um, or something like that, or it's, it's in a community where they, have association dues or they actually have a management group take care of the property because they're not there. Um, you know, somebody's splitting time between New York and Florida, you know, we want to make sure that they understand that. Uh, mortgage interest um, and property taxes. Again, you know, if you own a double, um, you know, and you bought it and you paid a mortgage and pay the property taxes, only the half that applies to the um, rental property would be um, subject to that, okay? Uh, repairs, this one we gotta be careful on. Uh, we're gonna talk about that again when we do problems. You know, if it's truly a repair, um, you know, I put in a new toilet, okay? You know, that's where we can take it as a repair. But if I renovated the bathroom, 
that's a little bit different, okay? So we wanna kind of take and look at that a little bit differently because we wanna realize that that would be much more of a, a capital improvement because we've added to the value of the property, okay? So we always gotta be careful that we, we do that. Uh, we'll talk about some things that would allow us to take some things um, for uh, uh, more of an expense like that versus depreciation uh, with uh, the, a special set of circumstances, okay? We talked about real estate taxes, uh, utilities. You know, I know in New York, um, you're required to provide the water, um, so you have to pay the water, and that would be an expense for the half that relates to the uh, rental or whatever it may be, um, if it's a double. But, uh, you know, if you're paying any of the other utilities and it's for the person that is renting in, in, in that income property, that's where you want to have that. Okay. All right. A couple quick questions here. Let me get the chat up here. Give me one second. Okay. All right, Pat had a question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Uh, okay, as far as um, Pat was asking, uh, sorry, I missed this one. It didn't pop up on my screen for a reminder, but uh, um, as far as the Section 179 and the Special Depreciation, um, they are exclusive, but you can only take one or the other. Um, so you can't take them together. You've got to take them separate. Um, and as far as leaving money on the table, again, that's where you become a little bit of a financial planner for the individual because you got to take a look at and say, well, do we really need that expense this year or should we take it and push it off to future years to put against future income to try to manage our tax liability? So, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, where we, we kind of manage that, okay? Uh, Tony had a question. Well, uh, when you talk about flips, you're handling those different. Flips are not rentals. If you're doing uh, flipping houses, you're more of a, in a business, you're on a Schedule C. Um, so we have that, you know, the, the, the C, the flipping of a house should be handled on a Schedule C because really that house becomes inventory because it's really your job, okay? Um, yeah, but when it's, a, uh, when it's a flip, it's not on a Schedule E, it's on a Schedule C. Now, if you have a rental and they held it and had it in the business and it was rented for part of the year and then sold it, yeah, you're going to be, you know, hit uh, depending on how long it was held, short-term versus long-term capital gains for the rental sale. Um, but a flip, that's handled totally different. Those are handled on Schedule Cs. Um, I have a client that, you know, kind of got into the flip thing. You know, he has 38 rentals, and then a few of them he was deciding, well, buy this one, and I think I can make more just flipping it. Well, you know, the flip was handled a little bit different because it's on a Schedule C as business income and, uh, you know, subject to self-employment tax. So, you know, if it's a rental where it's been rented and you're in the business, you know, for profit of making rental income, then it's on a Schedule E. If it's never been in the rental pool or been advertised to be rented and they just bought it and flipped it, that's a Schedule C, okay? All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, this one too, this is what I was talking about earlier um, when I said something about depreciation and repairs and kind of, you know, making sure that we categorize them correctly. Okay. Um, this is the de minimis safe harbor election. And as it talks about here, this is an opportunity for you to take something and it says uh, businesses with applicable financial statements may use the safe harbor election to deduct or expense in parentheses Amounts paid for tangible property up to 5,000. For those who don't have an AFS, the limit is 2,500 per invoice or item, okay? What Safe Harbor does is it allows you to take and expense that as opposed to depreciate that. Um, you have to do a little form that's in there um, and there's a little section there that you can see that is the verbiage uh, that we will use. Um, 
Oops. Uh, let me just get my pen up here. All right. So you can see down this paragraph, it has the little verbiage in there and talks about it. Um, basically, what you've decided to do is, is have that, um, you know, what would normally be and what we think of as a depreciable asset. You basically make the uh, de minimis safe harbor election to say, no, nope, I'm not going to use it as depreciation. It's below 2500 for me. I'm going to take it as an expense. And we would do it that way. Okay. And, uh, you know, what that does is uh, for a lot of things, um, you know, since it's not depreciated and it's not showing up that way on the return, um, it would help us down the road when we have to recapture, um, if you will, some of the depreciation that we've taken and it, uh, you know, it keeps that out of that. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, depreciation. Yep. Here it rears its ugly head again. Um, depreciation's back. Um, again, you know, this is just a different pie, okay? Um, uh, my wife being in the uh, purveyor of, of bakery goods, um, she has uh, somebody that she sells to, and before we were probably talking a little bit more like the pumpkin pie, the little flat top thing here. Um, you know, with rental properties, we're talking a little bit more about uh, the meringues or the mile high apple pie, those ones that are stacked eight inches tall. This is our rental property because most of the time, you know, as opposed to the things that we saw with our business that were those five, seven year type things, uh, you know, when we get rental properties, we're into 27 and a half years. Um, so they can be depreciated over for a long period of time. Uh, we may not see as many section 179s as we saw uh, with our uh, uh, Schedule C income, but uh, we will have some, as you can see here. But again, you know, when we look at depreciation and the recovery here, uh, some of the things that we put in there that are not capital improvements, that are not permanent, if you will, or part of the structure or add to the value, um, those are five years. And we talk about appliances, carpets, possibly furniture that we put in there if we provide a furnished uh, one, okay? Uh, we can see roads, shrubbery, and fences down there. And then at the bottom, we have residential rental property. Um, you know, things that we do there that, again, add value to the property, those capital improvements, if you will, that uh, we do on there that, that uh, have uh, that 27 and a half years uh, um, that we use under our maker's GDS system, okay? All right, so we have that. Um, talk about makers here. Um, we're still gonna use makers and GDS, so we have that. Um, we can see here that uh, we have one table, uh, the convention for these is always going to be mid-month, and as you can see from here, you know, the way the table's set up, you know, it's pretty much a, it is, you know, not a perfect straight line, but it's very similar, um, and we use that mid-month, and you can tell, you know, if I put it in service in January, I'm going to get a pretty good chunk of the whole year's depreciation, but if I put it, you know, in the 12 column over here, on the right, I'm you know going to get a much smaller first year, but you can see over the remainder, okay, we have all the 27 and a half years, um, and again it goes into 29 because to get truly 27 and a half, if I'm putting it in service in the first year, 12th month, I'm probably going to really get into a 29th year to get 27 and a half, okay. But you can see that percentage is pretty you know flat throughout all the years. Um, like I said, the, uh, one of the homework things I'm going to have for you is to do uh, some prior years depreciation for some rentals that maybe have been put in service 10, 12, 15 years ago, okay? So that's where we're going to have that, all right? Um, we have some special situations. Um, you know, these are things with rental income where we handle things a little bit different. Um, okay, so, you know, the big ones that I want to talk about um, if we have a dwelling unit used as a home, and if the dwelling unit is both rented to others and also used as a personal residence, um, we talked about the fact that we take a percentage of that. Um, the one that I want to talk about here, and we see a lot, is uh, used as a home but rented less than 15 days. Um, believe it or not, um, and the best example of this is a lot of times for professional golfers when they go to a tournament site, uh, especially for a larger event, um, you know, and they want to be there to prepare for a couple weeks, 
they will rent people's homes in the area. Um, and, you know, when they rent that, and it's less than 15 days. Um, actually, that's something that you don't have to declare as income. Okay. It's, it's not reported. You don't have to do that. Um, in this area up here, uh, Oak Hill Country Club up in Rochester, uh, several people, they have major tournaments like the PGA Championship or the Ryder Cup. If you're a golfer and you know what those are, um, you know, and those people come in with their entourage and rent those houses, you know, and if they rent for less than 15 days, that's, that's really, you know, basically rent free income. Okay. So we have that. All right. Um, let's see here. Um, losses on rentals, um, we can have losses. You know, obviously if you have uh, something that happened where you had it rented three months and you evicted somebody and you got in there and they, you know, took the refrigerator and the stove with them and they weren't supposed to and, you know, left the bathroom in shambles and holes in the walls and things like that. Obviously you've got a lot of expenses and you may not have income while you're, you're getting that back up and going. And then you advertise and come August, you got to back out there. Well you know, you might have had a loss for that year um, just because of, of the, the sequence of events. But, you know, again, this talks about those at-risk rules that if we have a loss there that, you know, we make sure that we take it. Now, depending on what else is on your return uh, because of that at-risk at and passive activities, um, we may have to um, take what would be called a net operating loss and pass some of that forward to the next year. We might be limited on our losses. So, Make sure that you understand that, okay? All right, royalties. Um, as I talked about, uh, royalties from copyrights, patents, and oil, gas, and mineral properties are taxable as ordinary income, okay? So if any of you out there have decided to write a song about the tax law, um, kind of, um, I won't date myself, but uh, you know, I can remember my kids watching um, Schoolhouse Rock, and they would write uh, things about, uh, you know, the government and how it's only a bill, you know, sitting on Capitol Hill for any of you that remember that. Um, I might have to bring that up for us at some point. But uh, we have that, you know, some things that, uh, you know, we have that would be uh, literary, musical, or artistic works, you know, something that is proprietary uh, to an individual and they receive royalties on it. That will go on the schedule also. Okay. Um, I have a couple clients that uh, are teachers that have written books, and they have royalties off that with the arrangements that they're set up on that, okay? Um, on page 1521, you got uh, the Schedule E there, um, you know, and again, very looks very similar to what we saw with the Schedule C. Only difference is, you know, in this case, uh, you know, on the Schedule C, we had one business, and remember the importance of keeping businesses separate. You have one business and one business type, you know, especially the business code that is on the Schedule C. On the Schedule E, we have, um, you know, the ability to put three different properties or two properties in a rental or whatever it may be there, okay? All right, so we have that and all the instructions for the Schedule E, okay? Uh, had a few problems, you know, to do by hand. Um, you know, we'll kind of let you work on those. And that's about it. We're going to talk a little bit more about the rentals when we get in there. All right. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to take about a five-minute break. I'll let everybody freshen up their coffee and stretch their legs. Uh, then we're going to go through um, 16. Um, um, that's a, a chapter near and dear to my heart as I am a uh, New York State of Health navigator for the, the health care law or the Affordable Care Act. And I'm also a licensed agent for Medicare. Um, so I do both of those. So healthcare is near and dear to my heart. And, you know, after the passing of the Affordable Care Act, sometimes known as Obamacare, um, we were, you know, it, it became a part of a lot of people's lives because of its being on the tax return now. You know, the, the, your health insurance was never really on your tax return, but it is now. Okay. All right. So we will take um, about five minutes. Now, well, let's see here. It is almost 10 till. Why don't we say we'll be back at 10 o'clock straight up. We'll go through this. And then, like I said, I want to make sure with the rest of the time that um, at the end, I think I mentioned it last session that uh, I'm going to do some of the problems. Um, you know, I'm trying to, uh, while we're on the break, I'm going to make sure I pick out some problems where it'll be good reviews for us as we move closer to the final. Um, and we talk about uh, some of the things I want to make sure that I have you focus on and understand. Um, couple problems I know uh, with people 
Um, I'm hoping that we can set up some one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions to help them or they can come into the class, uh, our classroom here at the new corporate office and I can help them because uh, some of those worksheets uh, are hidden. Um, but you know, if you want to know the Schedule B, the Schedule D, and the Schedule 4562, which we're doing appreciation on, all three of those forms um, have information on them and they're very important information, but we never put, in TaxWise, never put numbers directly on those, okay? There's worksheets, so Schedule B, Schedule D, and 4562, all three of those are very important forms for our tax return, but we have to make sure that we don't put information directly on them, that we use the worksheets that support them, and we'll see that, okay? All right, so we will do that. Um, again, if you have some things that you want me to kind of address as we go through, uh, pop those in the um, uh, chat while we're on, and I'll address those when we come back on, but otherwise, we'll, we'll be back at uh, 10 o'clock straight up.
All right, everybody. Um, hope everybody's back. Um, I'll just kind of give a, a couple minutes here um, for everybody to get situated and get seated back down. Um, like I talked about, I've got a problem here that I uh, looked at during the break uh, that we're going to do. And hopefully it's a good one because it'll give us a chance to, to kind of bring back some of the things that we talked about at the outset uh, that we're going to see on the uh, computer final that you're going to have on that. And so we're going to have that. Um, we're also going to have um, some uh, items that, like I said, that uh, hopefully will be of assistance to kind of help you uh, navigate those uh, those tax wise little nuances with things that uh, are the um, uh, worksheets and stuff that are embedded in that. Okay. All right. So we are back. Um, We'll take care of uh, Chapter 16. Uh, as I said uh, before the break, uh, this is one that's kind of near and dear to my heart uh, with the healthcare. Um, you know, I just uh, kind of ended up, uh, you know, there was a, a point that we had to, um, you know, once the Affordable Care Act was passed and, and the penalty on your insurance or the proof of health insurance uh, started becoming part of people's tax returns, um, you know, we realized that the dialogue was there and People are sitting across the table or desk from us, and they're saying that, uh, well, I don't have health insurance. Where, what do I get? I can't afford it. Or, you know, they don't understand it. Um, you know, and, and we've helped uh, several hundreds of people uh, with myself and my staff. Um, we have a component of EG Tax called EG Health Connect uh, that we help people do the enrollment in the marketplace uh, and or uh, make their selections for Medicare. Um, you know, uh, equally confusing. And Medicare has been confusing for a long time. I'm sure those of you that are 65 or approaching 65, uh, you know, you, you cringe at the fact that leading up to October, your mailbox is always full of stuff from all the insurance companies uh, wanting to buy for your business. Um, you know, it is a big business, Medicare and, and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes it's tough to discern it and that's what we do. Okay. All right. As far as healthcare, um, as we talked about, it is because of the Affordable Care Act, okay? And basically what the, you know, the, the stuff that we have to do um, on a tax return is that we have to show that somebody has minimum essential coverage. Um, if they did not have coverage uh, on a tax return, you know, we as tax preparers have to be prepared to help them find an exemption. How are we going to have a way for them not to pay this penalty? Um, especially if it's a financial burden or something like that or, or extenuating circumstances. Uh, we'll kind of talk about how we get that, um, you know, how to make, you know, I, I guess they try to do it politically correct, um, you know, to say that you have to make a shared responsibility payment. Um, you know, then they call it a penalty and the Supreme Court, you know, basically called it a tax, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, that that amount that you pay for not having insurance, you know, how is that calculated, okay? Um, everything on the way that we're talking about is based on things uh, as far as uh, uh, the insurance. You may have insurance through an employer. You might have Medicare. Uh, you might have some other form. We'll talk about that. But if you've gone through the marketplace, uh, you have the opportunity to get what's called a premium tax credit. Um, that is a credit that's given to you um, in one of two forms on your tax return or on, as it says, an advanced monthly uh, or advanced premium tax credit where they pay it to your insurance provider on your behalf to help you cover your premiums each month. Um, either one of those, you have to reconcile it at the end of the year on your tax return. And that's where that comes into play on the 8962, okay? Uh, 8965, that's a form and I'm gonna talk about it. Um, we at EG Tax and as tax preparers, um, you know, for EG Tax, we love to exhaust all possibilities for that exemption from this penalty or shared responsibility, um, better known as a tax, um, you know, to be able to, you know, do it. It's, it's, I've always thought it odd that they call the part that you pay for not having insurance a shared responsibility payment, but when they're giving you money, they call it a tax credit. So, you know, just semantics, but it's kind of the way they do it. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about. Health coverage. Um, the Affordable Care Act said that everybody had to have minimum essential coverage. Okay. Um, that minimum essential coverage had to be met for everybody that is in the tax family. Okay. 
Uh, when we talk about the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act and, and the coverage of health insurance, we're talking about their tax family or their tax household. Not necessarily who lives under the roof, but who is on the tax return, better known as their tax family. So that would, you know, a family of four might include mom, dad, and, and uh, two dependents. Um, you know, if we're claiming mom or grandma's living with us or whatever, you know, well, then she's also on there too. Now, the thing about that is when you go to apply for health insurance, that is what the income that you use is based on, okay? This is one of the little nuances that makes it kind of unique because your tax family um, income on your tax return is different than your tax income. If mom and dad make $100,000, that's what we consider our adjusted gross income or maybe modified adjusted gross income, okay? But for health insurance purposes, if I have a son or daughter that works at uh, you know McDonald's and makes $5,000, I have to add that income to my 100. And then I have mom living with me and I have her as a dependent and she has social security. Well, I add her Social Security. That's part of my household's income for the marketplace. Now, my son or daughter's McDonald's income and Social Security does not show up on my tax return, but it is in my calculations for reconciling the uh, premium tax credit or getting that premium tax credit through the marketplace. So that's where that sometimes gets a little confusing for folks. Okay. All right. Minimum essential coverage. We've got a great little table here that talks about it. Uh, the best way to point this out that I want everybody to notice is that if you take a look at, okay, right here, for those of you that have Medicare, all right, um, Medicare Part A coverage meets minimum essential coverage. So really what we're talking about, um, all these other ones obviously have more than just what this is, but really minimum essential coverage to meet that standard on this list and to be placed on this list is just hospitalization. It doesn't have to cover your doctors. It doesn't have to cover your prescriptions. It just has to cover, you know, whatever hospitalization. What we would think of uh, for us that may have had insurance years ago is what we used to call major medical, okay? So that's where we would cover with that, all right? So that's what this one is. Uh, that's our minimum essential coverage uh, that we have, and that's what we have to meet. Now you can see on this list, you know, employer plans, um, you can get stuff through the individual market. Um, you know, maybe you're in what, uh, you know, uh, health uh, share, uh, you know, MediShare they call it. Sometimes the co-ops you hear about, um, you know, uh, through the military, um, you know, children's programs, veterans, you know, even if you have insurance, uh, you know, we see sometimes up here that uh, somebody is still a Canadian st a citizen and still has their Canadian health insurance, but they live here in the States. Well, you know, then they've met minimum essential coverage. Okay. All right. And as it says there, um, you know, coverage individual is physically absent from the United States, but coverage uh, that is one day of a month, that is considered a whole month of coverage. Okay. Now, if you do not have coverage, we have three ways that we can get exemptions. We can get it from what's called a marketplace. Um, that's the, you know, each state has its own or maybe part of the federal marketplace. Uh, we can ask for an exemption there. Um, all but one of those exemptions have to be asked for prior to the tax year. So if you know you're on hard times or something's coming up and you're asking, hey, I can't afford my insurance this year, you know, you have to ask that before the fact, not after the fact when you file your tax return. Now, there is a form that you can do for the marketplace that is after the fact, and that would be a hardship. And we'll talk about that here in a second, okay? Um, we have coverage exemptions claimed for your household. Um, this is an exemption that you're given depending on your household's income relative to the filing threshold, okay? However much of your income is above the filing threshold. So that is another possibility. And then the one that we use most often on the 8965, and this would be part three, is coverage exemptions claimed on your tax return. Um, you know, we're going to talk about, and we'll kind of see those um, that on the chart here, but you can see the ones that are in the middle column, and then with the codes, the letters on the right, these are the ones that we'll start to use on the federal to say that somebody does not have insurance, okay? So we have to make sure that... Uh, um, that uh, we have, um, you know, make sure that we have, um, um, you know, some type of exemption. Um, we might have it where it considered it unaffordable. 
uh, that what we would have to pay for our insurance is greater than 8% of our income, okay? We would have um, short-term coverage gap, or maybe we had a job transition and we had that 60 or 90 day waiting period before insurance would kick in, uh, so we have that. Um, you can see there that there are people that, you know, certain uh, members of Indian tribes, obviously if you're incarcerated, you might have an exemption for your health insurance. Um, you might be a member of a, a specific uh, religious group, uh, things like that. Um, you know, like the ones I was talking to you about, the fact on the um, hardships. Um, let me get that, give me just a second here. One second. Okay, so. What I have up here um, right now is this is the one that this is the application that if we have somebody, and again, we'll see this when we do a problem here shortly, but uh, this is the one that we would do um, if we kind of are there and we want a marketplace and basically we're asking for a, a hardship, okay? Um, as you can see on here, these are the categories for the hardships. You can give numbers, you know, you're homeless, you're evicted, you know, Hey, I forgot to pay the light bill. I got a showed off notice, you know, that could do uh, domestic violence, bankruptcy, um, you know, unexpected increase in expenses because we had a ill, disabled or aging family member. Um, you know, we had some medical bills. Um, somebody that was in your household became ineligible for Medicaid because of something, whatever the circumstances were. And then my favorite is number 14. It says you experienced a hardship not listed in categories one through 13 that kept you from getting health insurance. So basically, one through 13 don't apply to you. 14 gives you the opportunity to make your own up, okay? So that you can try to get that exemption. Um, personally, I've probably done two or three dozen of these for clients and uh, I've never had one come back, okay? Uh, they're sent to Kentucky separate from the return. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, you just kind of pick, um, you know, you send in a letter with support, um, you know, I guess a few tears dropped on the paper doesn't hurt either. And, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, I use the example, I had one where uh, it was somebody that a uh, couple of grandparents that were 62, um, you know, they weren't working, they had retired, um, but, you know, they were paying for some insurance and it met their budget, but uh, they had to take on two grandkids um, that were young and, you know, they had a lot of expenses for that. And, you know, they were basically the caregivers for them and, you know, they didn't have the excess to really, you know, pay for health insurance. And we sent in an explanation of the situation um, and they were fine. Uh, the marketplace said, that's fine. You don't have to pay the penalty for not having insurance this year. Um, obviously, I had to counsel them on the fact that, you know, not having insurance put them at risk as they were caring for the grandkids. But, you know, it was an opportunity there. Okay. So that's what we'll do, and we'll kind of talk about that, but that's the form that we have there, okay? Um, household income, again, I talked about that. Um, you know, we, we used the term earlier, MAGI, or Modified Adjusted Gross Income. You know, on the tax return, you know, the case of, on page one of Modified Adjusted Gross Income, you know, we have our AGI, and we might add back in, you know, Social Security or tax-exempt interest or whatever. Um, you know, that's a MAGI. But for health insurance purposes, that MAGI, we also have to add in the income of dependents are on the return or part of our tax household, okay? And we'll show you how that works in the form when we do that, okay? Um, the penalty for not having insurance um, as it stands right now, and again, I, I guess I should clarify this too, it's a great opportunity to talk about 2018 a little bit, but for 2017 and 18, even though the tax law have changed, 18, the shared responsibility is still in effect, which means that you still are required to have health insurance. Now, 2019, the shared responsibility goes away. Okay, the new tax law has decided to get rid of that. 
If that holds, we don't know, but as it stands right now, 2019, you will not be required to have health insurance, okay? But if you don't and you have to pay the penalty in 18, um, it's 2.5% of your household income above the filing threshold. So again, you know, you're taking really you know, the, the income for the tax family, subtracting your filing threshold, or $695 per adult and $347.50 per dependent up to $2,085, okay? So whichever is greater is the one that they will use, okay? Uh, proof of health insurance, uh, health coverage, I should say, uh, comes in three forms. Um, 1095As, those come from somebody that gets it through the government and the marketplace. 1095Bs would be somebody that has it through the employer or has Medicare or Medicaid. 1095C does not prove somebody's health insurance. It is given by the employer to the employee to show that they were offered health insurance. It does not state that they had taken it or have the coverage. You really have to have that A or B to prove that health insurance, okay? So we have that with the health insurance. Um, 8965, we're gonna talk about that when we get into the problems a little bit, okay? Um, shows you where the taxes show up on the, on the um, um, uh, forms, okay? All right, premium tax credit. What that is, again, it's the premium word is for your health insurance premiums. And basically, if you are in the marketplace, you have the opportunity to get a premium tax credit to help you pay for your insurance. Now, when you do the application for the upcoming year for your health insurance, you can say that I expect my income to be X dollars and the government says, okay, you're gonna get X dollars a month. Well, then I can take that as an advanced premium tax credit. So I can take that and tell the government, please send it to the insurance company that I have selected to help pay for my health insurance, okay? So that's the advanced premium tax credit. Now, whichever one it is, you're gonna reconcile it on the form 8962 on your tax return. What I mean by that is, if you got too much of a credit because you estimated your income wrong, or you didn't get enough and you do some more, you're gonna get that on your tax return. Um, this is where I have seen individuals, and, and this is where it, it uh, probably, more so than the penalty for not having insurance, okay, um, is the fact that, uh, you know, this premium tax credit, that a lot of people estimated their income incorrectly, and when they got to the tax return, and, and I have to inform them that they have um, um, uh, no refund anymore because they had to pay back all these insurance premiums, they're not happy, okay? Um, how do you prove coverage through the VA, which doesn't send either? Uh, typically, a uh, veteran's card. Um, you know, my wife is a 20-year military veteran uh, who retired in 2010. Um, you know, and for veterans besides uh, Mr. Hemingway there that, uh, um, you know, are, are with us, you know, thank you for everything you do. But uh, typically, if they have a VA card, um, you know that they're covered all 12 months. Um, yeah, I know that uh, the government, you know, they do it for Medicare and, and uh, Sometimes you will see a 1095B mailed out to them. I've seen a few uh, from the Department of Veteran Affairs, depending on the coverage they have. But as long as that coverage to the VA and, and, and like I said, you know, TRICARE for Life and some of that other VA benefits and stuff, um, meet minimum essential coverage as long as you have a veteran's card uh, to prove that you're a veteran, you know, that's, that's good enough. Okay. All right, so we have the advanced premium tax credit. Um, Again, we talked about coverage family, very much similar to your tax family. You know, whoever you're saying has that insurance, you have to make sure that you understand that, um, you know, that you have that on there. Now, one thing I will point out, everybody has this question, and when I helped them enroll, they said, well, why should we be married? We'll just do married filing separate, then each of our income is lower, so we'll get more of a tax credit. No, that's not the case. Um, you know, you cannot do married filing separate to either avoid the penalty or to um, uh, get more of a premium tax credit inside the marketplace. Basically what they do is they say that if you do not have, or you do married filing separate on your return, when you go to do the insurance, you do not get um, any subsidy credit and you're not able to enroll for Medicaid or Child Health Plus or anything like that, okay? 
Um, the other thing is too, is that, uh, um, you know, when we talk about the marketplace is, you know, make sure that you understand that those are the only individuals that are going to the marketplace that get the premium tax credit. If you have insurance through an employer sponsored plan, you are not eligible to try to get the premium tax credit. Um, typically, the reason for that is, is most employer plans, the employee is not paying full premium. You know, even if you have an employer that's offering you insurance and you're paying the full premium, you're still not going to get, uh, if you're income and qualify, you're still not going to get a premium tax credit. You have to get insurance from the marketplace. Okay. Um, income limits. Everything in the marketplace and the premium tax credit and the calculation of everything is based on the percentage of the poverty level. Uh, federal poverty level usually is released sometime over the summer, July, August, um, so that's in place. Um, you know, and you know, again, these are the numbers for 2017. Um, most states, Medicaid goes by 100% of the federal poverty level, and then the credits stop at 400% of the federal poverty level. Um, you know, that's for the 48 states, a uh, little higher on the poverty level for uh, Hawaii and Alaska, uh, but for the other 48, you know, this is where we're at. Um, you can tell by family size. Uh, some states have what's called expanded Medicaid, so it's 138% of the federal poverty level that you, below that, you still qualify for Medicaid. But uh, those are the numbers, and, and again, that's what drives the, um, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the amount of credit and or how much of the credit you have to pay back. All right, um, there's a 1095A, and again, a lot of this comes in with these columns filled in. Um, you know, what was the premium that of the uh, insurance that you enrolled? Um, everything is, uh, for calculation of the credit, is based on the second lowest cost silver plan, which again is just kind of a, you know, confusing fact, okay? Uh, we have the pro, pro premiums. Uh, talked about the advanced premium tax credit. Um, again, you're going to have a little 1095A that you get to fill out um, at 8962 there in that example, and they see if they paid too much or paid too little. You know, if it's if you didn't get enough of a credit, don't fret. You didn't leave money on the table. You're going to get it as part of your refund on the federal. Okay. Okay, so 1095A. Okay, so we have net premium tax credit. Good there. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go in and we're going to do a problem here. Uh, let's see, where'd my software go? There it is. Okay. All right, so we're going to go into tax wise. We're going to do a problem here. Okay. Um, what I've decided to do, uh, we're going to do a problem out of 15, uh, chapter 15. It's 15.2 in your workbook. Um, if you want to take a look at it, um, it's on page 15.10 in the workbook. Um, like I said, uh, I'm going to do the problem here on the screen for you. So we will have it that way. And then that way you will be able to take a look at... Um, what goes on, uh, this is gonna be one that we have that has uh, a rental and uh, has some other things going on. Um, has some interesting bullet points. All right, so we're gonna start a new return, okay? And remember that we have to enter that by the, um, the uh, uh, social security number. We're gonna use a little bit of a different one because uh, this problem is probably already in here somewhere. All right, computer, come on, there we go, okay. Okay, so we're gonna get into our software, okay? All right, so we're in there, and as I said, we're doing the Zigglers. Uh, friends Tom and Judy um, are our clients here. Uh, remember, you know, again, I'm kind of reviewing this for things as we're coming to the end, uh, but everything's gonna be typed in caps. Um, so we have uh, Thomas, and we're going to have uh, his wife is Judith. Okay. 
Okay, so we have that. All right. Uh, reminder, you know, don't use this name line too. That would be something that you'd use if, if the taxpayer's spouse was deceased on the return. Uh, they're living at 404 Wood, uh, Woodlawn Avenue in Buffalo. And we have their email address. Again, very important that we get that um, because of restrictions that we have as far as being a tax service, if somebody calls and would like to have uh, their elect, uh, return sent to them electronically, we have to have an email on file. We have to have them do that when they are in front of us and we can prove identity. Um, oops. We're gonna have that uh, just using the cell. Um, birthdays, again, very important that we make sure we get those birthdays in correctly. Um, in this case, we have somebody that's 58. So we know that from our retirement section that uh, they have not reached their 59 and a half birthday. So they're gonna be subject to uh, penalties should they do something with the retirement and taking it out early. Um, he, is a, whoops, he is a welder and she is an RN. Uh, occupation, not important, but you know, make sure that you have it in there. Uh, as soon as they state something, if I see somebody that's an RN, uh, first thing that's gonna pop in my mind is maybe we have something on the Schedule A for job expenses, their license, you know, is she a visiting nurse where she's not paid miles, you know, things like that will pop into my mind uh, to kind of say, hey, you know, what's going on with this return, okay? Um, we have married filing joint um, that it talks about, that's in the bullet points, they'd like to do a joint return. And we can see on the return that they have a couple dependents. Uh, their first one is Herman, okay? And Herman. And the social security number. Now, once I see somebody named Herman that's dependent on my return and he's over the child tax credit, in this case he's 22, first thing that's gonna come out of my mouth is I'm sitting there with that person, I'm gonna say, hey, is uh, Herman in college, you know, because then it would make a difference if I would be able to claim him, you know, maybe he's 22 and has enough income and he's not in college. Well, you know, then we'd have to be hard pressed, whoops, we'd be hard pressed to have him on the return if he's above, you know, four or $5,000 um, because of the rules about claiming a child, okay? That's for 17, 18 might be a little bit different, um, just because of the uh, new rules with the uh, above the child tax credit for the family credit. Um, DC, um, this one I would check if I saw that Herman was five years old. DC's dependent care. I always have you checked earned income credit uh, just because it's not going to hurt the return. Won't be calculated if they're not eligible, but it's always good to have on there because that's a big credit for a lot of people is that earned income credit and we want to make sure that we don't miss it. Okay, uh, we have Mandy as their daughter. Um, she's a little younger than Herman. Okay, but again, she's too old for the child tax credit. Um, reason being is she reached her 17th birthday during this tax year. So she is not any longer eligible for that um, child tax credit, okay? Uh, we have a daughter that lived in our house for 12 months and that she is our child. Again, not young enough for that dependent care. Um, as I remind everybody, there's magical ages. Uh, first one is under 13, dependent care. Under 17, child tax credit. Under 19, earned income credit. Under 24, earned income credit if they're in college, okay? Next magic age, 59 and a half for uh, retirement. And then the following special age, 70 and, a half, 70 and a half years old for required minimum distributions, okay? Uh, live in New York, um, from their bio sheet, we have that they'd like to take care, oops, take care of their uh, you know, refund or balance due electronically. So we'll make sure we get their bank information in there, okay? All right, we have that. And we have a taxpayer, it's a five digit pin. And like I said, I typically use their zip code. Uh, works out nicely on that, okay? Make sure you get the date in there correctly, all right? Uh, make sure it shows up as 2018. 
Um, sometimes, you know, your fingers get flying along and all of a sudden it shows up as 1918. Um, there was some tax then, but I'm sure it was not the 1040 that we see in front of us today that they had to file in 1918, okay? Um, you know, once you get uh, the clients in front of you, you will complete their driver's license information. So make sure that you do that. For this sake, we're just going to prove that they actually exist and they appear who they are. Um, even though they might have a, not have a driver's license, we'll say that they are Uber people. Okay. And then, like I said, when you get uh, going in the class, you're going to get a preparer ID that they'll assign to you in the office. Um, once you have that, you pop that in. You know, it takes and uh, everything is then. Um, you know. Um, populates okay all right and we're gonna go to our 1040 remember I like to go off the 1040 um, especially as a new preparer I like you to do that because inevitably that's where your calculations are gonna end up I want you to see where it should go and where it comes back to okay how it gets there so if you use the 1040 I think that's great you may later on like to navigate by using the tree on the left um, when I refer to the tree, it's the thing below the blue box, the refund monitor, or, you know, the highlighter. I, as I say here, my clients like to watch the highlights as things go up and down on the credit. Um, or some people may but like to use the add a form um, where you pop that open and you just type in the form you need. Um, you know, you'll kind of learn your own keystrokes or how you navigate. But starting out, I like everybody to be on that 1040. Use that 1040 because I want you to see where it's going to go, how it impacts our, our total tax. You know, this is where the rubber meets the road and it all comes together. Okay. So we have that. All right. So the next thing we're going to do, um, so we're in there, take a look at our bullet points real quick here. Um, on our bullet points, it says that Thomas and Judith filed a 1040 last year. Well, you know, most of the time that would say to me, hmm, I wonder if they itemized. They weren't able to itemize last year and owed a state, the estate additional $450. So if I look at my 1040, one of the first things I wanna answer here is a little box in the center. Did they itemize last year? In this case, it's no, okay? Remember, if they did itemize, we might have to claim some of their total, or their, ta their refund from the state as taxable income. In this case, they didn't. But now, one thing that we are gonna notice is that they owed money, okay? They owed $450, all right? Eventually, it's gonna end up on the Schedule A because we get credit for it as tax paid this year, but we have to figure out how it gets there. And we're gonna take, and we're gonna to go to the payment section, okay? Even though it's not a payment for the current tax year, it was a payment. They paid $450 during this current tax year. So we go to line 65, and remember, you know, I like to do this where I like to go into the box, say, okay, hmm, this is where it goes. How am I going to get it there? I hit that F9 button and I take a look at it. There it is. Okay. I have that on there. Oh, federal stack state tax payments. Let's see what that one does. Okay. So again, we're there. Federal's top. When I come down here and look around on the form, state, uh, okay, here. New York State and or local balance due from the previous return paid in 2017. That's what they did. So I have my $450 is gonna go right in there and that's where I paid that, okay? So we got that. Uh, it says on our next bullet point that Thomas and Judith get a refund and they'd like to deposit their checking account. If they owe, they'll send a check. We talked about that with the information. Uh, we're doing their main info sheet there that we talked about. Um, neither Thomas nor Judith was a full-time student, or did they take money out of her retirement in the past three years? This is one of the things that statement's made because that's one of the questions that they choose to contribute to an IRA um, to help lower their tax liability. Um, no EIC or child tax credit was disallowed in the previous year. And as we say here, <clears throat> the next bullet point says the Ziegler family had health coverage for the entire year. So on our tree on the left, we're gonna to go to the ACA worksheet. And our first question, did the taxpayer spouse or any dependent receive insurance through the marketplace? All right, no, they got it from an employer. And were they granted an exemption? They didn't need one, so we're gonna say no. And then we're gonna take a look at it, and after each one of them, there's a box that says, had minimum essential coverage, or is applying or for granted an exemption for all 12 months, 
Okay, so we're gonna check that off for each one of them, that they had insurance all 12 months. Um, after we do the uh, rest of the return, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna play with this one a little bit as far as health insurance for everybody, okay? All right, so we have, all right. Okay, so we have that information. We got the Ziegler's uh, bio in there. So now we're gonna get uh, the income. And again, I like you to put income in first uh, so that you kind of go there and then we can go for the other stuff. Uh, right now, again, I look on my tree on the left, there's a W-2. I can get it from add a form. I can also get it by going to my 1040, going to that box where the income and wages, hitting F9 and you see all the options of all the different forms that I can use, okay? So in this case, we're gonna go back to our W-2. Uh, the first one we have is for the taxpayer, Thomas. So we check that box. Uh, we make sure that the address on the W-2 matches the address on the screen. Um, we're gonna complete with the um, EIN number of the employer, okay? In this case, electric furnace. And then we're gonna put the wages in. So we have $54,968.23. Um, had withholding of $1,210. Now, if I'm a tax preparer, that's a red light to me right away because that's awful low withholding for somebody that had $54,000 in wages, okay? And if you look at the little box up on the top, yeah, it's gonna create a balance due if, it, if we stopped right where we were at, okay? Um, now, box 12, we have a couple things that are in there. First one is the code D, and as we talked about that, that's contributions to retirement. Uh, so we're doing that uh, D there, put the $4,000 in. If you'll notice, up on the, and again, to remind you, up on the top, these boxes changed, okay, from what they were before. Because now our box one has taxable income, but box three and five are now increased by 4,000 because that's our real income. Our income, $4,000 was contributed to our retirement. That is tax-free on the way out, on the way in. We'll pay tax when we take it out, probably like a 401k or something. So that makes our taxable wages in the year less, okay? So we have that. Now, next thing we have is, in that same box, we have a DD code. Another method besides a 1095A and 1095B for us to prove that we had health insurance. So that DD code, we have that there, okay? Um, for 13, because they're contributing to a retirement plan, we're gonna check our box there. And then on this one, we have New York State Disability Insurance, okay? So they're paying in for their disability insurance. All right, and then down at the bottom, make sure you have your state correct uh, that matches up. We had uh, did a problem the other day in one of the classes that I uh, had them try to do an Ohio return, which was a lot of fun for most of them. So we have that, and then we have their state withholding, which oddly enough is greater than the federal, so that's gonna help us on that situation, okay? So we got our W-2 in there for, um, for Thomas, okay? now. Next one we have, and this is again where I was talking about the ad set, we have some interest income, all right? They have a document on 1512 that is from First National Bank. So again, i like you to go back to the 1040, um, find that interest income line, go in there, hit F9, what do I have? Well, we know that it goes on a Schedule B. So we're gonna put it there on the Schedule B, okay? So we have that, all right? Um, now, we could put it right on the Schedule B, but again, Schedule B, Schedule D, 4562, I don't want it right on there. I want to make sure that it is put on a worksheet to help us make sure it gets to the right spots besides what goes on the Schedule B, all right? Again, a couple of errors I saw a couple times, you know, um, with a few people, was that seller finance mortgage, nothing goes up there unless we're holding the mortgage of a house. But down here under other interest, we're gonna go in there and hit F9. This is where we're gonna get this little worksheet, okay? And in this case, we have a 1095, or excuse me, 1099 IMT, and we have it from First National Bank, okay? And on that interest income, 
we have $1,456, okay? So we have that, but we always still have something in box three, okay? If we look at that, the way I like to do it is, I'm gonna put First National Bank, FNB, and then I have bonds, okay? So the bonds is 1899.88, and then I have to do where I adjust that on the state. In New York, bond interest on, on savings bonds is not taxable, so I'm gonna put that, so I'm gonna be able to back that out. So I'm gonna put that there. And then also on this, we had some tax withheld. Okay, so we can put the 450. Using this worksheet that's inside the Schedule B, you can see on your tree on the left, I got my Schedule B, and then I have my little form that does inside of it, makes everything flow to where it needs to go correctly. So we always wanna make sure that we try to use that, okay? All right, we have another 1099 INT, this one's for Judith. And this comes from First National. All right. And 600, whoops, $623 on that one, okay? Now, if we wanted to, and again, everybody always asks TSJ, okay? Well, we can put this one as taxpayer, this one as taxpayer, and this one as spouse. Or we could say that the first two were their joint account. Okay, so whatever we want to do with that. All right. All right. Uh, next thing they had on there was a mortgage interest statement. We're going to come back to that when we start talking about the rental. But remember, I mentioned Herman is in college. Okay, so we're going to go to 1040. Where is that college? It is a college credit. So that means that we're probably going to go to page two in our credit section. First place we're gonna to wanna to start always is non-refundable credits. So when I start the non-refundable credits, I see there's an education credit, has my form that I'm gonna need. So I hit F9 in there. I hit the education credit. And in there, I am able to complete the information. So I have my student's name is Herman. Okay, all right. Is, uh, Social Security number. Okay, Elmwood Avenue. All right, we did get a 1098T. Remember I said don't always rely on the 1098T. Sometimes those are good, sometimes those are bad. Um, I'd much rather, uh, for my clients, they've kind of gotten used to with me that they make sure they bring in that statement of student account. All right, for the education credit, we have to decide, is it the American Opportunity or Lifetime Learning? And then as we talked about last time, we could possibly even end up using the tuition and fees deduction. You know, we want to see which one's going to maximize. Uh, in this case, he is in his first four years. He's an undergraduate. Okay. Well, actually, he's not. He's a graduate student. So he's already used his American opportunity. So we're gonna hit yes. A lot means that we bypass this. We go down to the lifetime learning. And in this case, we have to know, and this is that little trick, F5 gets us a calculator. We can say that we had tuition of 10,500 and we have to subtract the scholarships. We can only do qualified expenses, those that were actually paid by us, not the scholarships. We do that, subtract it and enter. All right, so we have that, and whoops, jumped on me, sorry. Okay, so we have that lifetime learning credit. All right, so we have that. Now, to see if what it did, we're gonna go back over, and sure enough, there it is. It carried to the 1040, right where we needed it, okay? All right, now, we have, as all we have left, really, is the fact that it says on the bullet points, that the Zigglers own a duplex and they rent half of it. They live in the other half, okay? So when it has information about the home, um, it talks about the fact that they uh, get $800 per month. It was rented the entire year. Uh, the tenants did not pay December's rent until January 10th, and they purchased the duplex on June 1st, 2002. So here's that one I was told you I was gonna throw your curve on. Um, they got it for 82,000 and the land value, which is usually approximately 10%, was 8,200. 
Okay, so we have, we're going to go to our 1040 again. I love people to start there and we're going to say, okay, I have rental real estate. So I'm going to go to my line for that on the 1040, hit F9. Here's my Schedule E that we talked about from the textbook. We're going to pop that open. Okay. First thing's up here, did you make any payments in 2017 that require you to file a 1099? You know, if I'm paying somebody to do snow removal for several properties, I might have issued them a 1099 if it was over $600, okay? Now, this is where we're gonna enter the address, and this is where I'm going to show you something, but I want you to make note that you never, ever, 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 ever use this form, okay? It just, creates a nightmare, and for those of you that have been doing returns and can't stand red on your tax return and wanna know why it's there and wanna get rid of it, this is something you don't wanna do, okay? So I'm gonna hit F9 for my options. Do not, I stress, do not ever use this rental A worksheet, okay? It is nice in some aspects, but in this case, I never, ever, ever want you to use it, okay? So we're gonna type in our address. So again, rental A worksheet. Um, it's kind of like the F8 key I told you about on your keyboard. You know, if you start overriding things, I'll come to the office that you're working in. I'm gonna take your F8 key away. I'll pop it right off your keyboard so you can't use it. Um, same thing, I'd love to be able to change the software and not have that worksheet in there, but uh, that's just not something we're able to do. So, but I do not want you it creates a real log jam for whoever may have the return for the next year, okay? Because it's, 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 the form doesn't quite work the way it should, okay? All right, so we have, they live, um, like I said, they're living in a double. So their property is the 404 uh, Woodlawn Avenue. And again, that's in Buffalo. Okay, um, it is a multifamily. If we take a look up above here, uh, we have a little section that allows us to, um, you know, kind of pick the code of our property, if you will, okay? And it obviously it says right below it, if type eight, and we gotta enter a description, but we have a single family, so it'd be a house, one family, multifamily, that'd be our duplex, vacation, commercial, land, royalties, um, don't worry about a self-rental, okay? But those are the categories. So in this case, we know that we have a multifamily, and they said there that it was available all year long, so 365 days. Now, what we learned from our um, text was uh, we have to claim we're on a cash basis, so we have to know what income we received. It says that they get $800 per month, but the December rent wasn't paid until January, okay? So our December rent was not paid until January. So that means they only got 11 months. So again, I'm gonna use my F5, use my calculator. I got $800, I'm gonna times it by 11 months. And when you put it in there like that, just hit enter and it'll take the number right into the square for you, okay? Um, let's see here. We'll talk about depreciation in just a second. Um, next thing we had, if you look at the expenses on 1510, we had homeowner's insurance, okay? But again, homeowner's insurance was for the entire house. And this fact, we have a duplex, so we're gonna divide it by two for our homeowner's insurance. We had some cleaning supplies, so we're gonna go down to our supply line. We had cleaning supplies for the rental. We had a window repair, and again, it was a repair to the window, but it was only in the tenant side, so we had some repairs there uh, for $43, okay? We had the garbage and water every six months, and that's for the entire property, so we multiply it by two and then divide it by two, so basically we're gonna say the utilities. Um, you can, since it's really not a utility, we can go here, to our other, hit F9, and we get a little other expense worksheet. Uh, that takes us over to the other side there, and that would be where we could put our user fee. And then you can see there's a column for each of the three properties. In this case, we're gonna put 454, okay? So we have that. 
Okay. We have paint for the son's bedroom. Oh, it's my son. Not unless I'm charging him rent. I can't write it off on the rental. We had exterminator, uh, ants around the entire house. And we're gonna put that under some maintenance things that we had. So that was the entire house. So we got the 160 divided by two. We got the $80 there. Um, and we had some legal fees for the rental. So some things to do to take care of things, okay? So basically we have our expenses in there. However, seeing that it's our house and we have a mortgage too, we have mortgage interest. And if you look at 1513, we have mortgage interest received from the borrower. <laughs> and it has the rental property on there. So we would go into our mortgage interest, but again, it is a double. So we have to take half of it. All right, so we have half of it. Oh, hold on, I got a question here. Uh, yep, Path, uh, you're correct, but from the problem, the only thing that it is, it's kind of circular math, if you will. Uh, the user fee for garbage and water was $454 every six months. So to get the whole year, we multiply it by two, and then we're gonna divide it by two because we have to take half, so then we're back to our 454. So, you know, it, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, garbage, water, you know, might be quarterly, things like that. So, you know, in this case, like I said, we got a little bit where we're chasing our tails, circular math um, with that on there, but uh, good catch, good catch, okay? Uh, I just did the mortgage interest to get the mortgage for the entire house, but we only get to take half on this. Now, because we did that, okay, the other half is for our personal residence. So we're gonna go over the Schedule A, and if we take a look here for, for interest paid, it didn't carry over. So we're gonna to have to manually say, okay, the other half of my $1,901 of mortgage interest is going to be for my personal Schedule A. Now there's a good chance that they won't get to um, itemize, you know, because of the standard deduction, it's tough when you're only getting half of your interest and half your property taxes, but sometimes it's more advantageous, you know, to take the standard and then take the expense um, against your uh, rental income, okay? Also on the 1098 with the mortgage interest statement is our property taxes. Again, same thing, property taxes is for the whole house and we're gonna take half of it, okay? So we have half of it there. All right. So that gets everything in as far as our tax documents. Gets everything in as far as our expenses. All we really have is what is left to... Uh, no, you cannot put the total mortgage interest on the Schedule A if it's more beneficial. Um, you know, you have to take it where it, it applies to. In this case with the double, because the Schedule A is for our personal residence and only half of that is our personal residence. Um, now, if it were the case that, uh, you know, things were um, going to be where this was, we were not in the, in the um, rental property for profit, not on the Schedule E, then yes, um, it would all go on the Schedule A because our income would show up on line 21, okay? All right, good question though, Tony, good question. Good catch, you guys are getting good paying attention. That's always good to keep me on my toes, okay? Now, last thing we have is our depreciation. Again, we have a line here just like we did on the Schedule D. We're gonna go into that. Here's our options, 4562, like I said, Schedule A, Schedule B, excuse me, Schedule B, Schedule D, and 4562, great forms where you use embedded. Again, this one, keeps popping up. It just, it's like, you know, it's just like a bad penny or whatever the old adage is, you know, but do not use it. So 4562, that's gonna get us this form and this is where our depreciation goes. And again, what I like to do is for each rental property, that's where I'm gonna name the 4562. In this case, it's for 404 Woodlawn, whoops, Woodlawn Avenue, okay, we have that. Then, Schedule B, Schedule D, 4562, do not use the form, do not put numbers directly on the form, use the worksheets. And in this case, this one's great, because if you take a look here, 
I love this statement. Description of property, which we want to do. Now, the other thing it says, for accurate computation, F9 to worksheet. Being a tax preparer, I would love nothing more than to not have to worry about the IRS because I had accurate computation, okay? So we're gonna go in there and we're gonna get that. So we're gonna use accurate computation, hit F9. Whoops, I'm sorry. What happened here? Okay. That we're going to have asset worksheet, and this is the great one we have. Okay. Especially for rentals, because we're going to be able to put everything in here. And also, you can see up here it has a place where if we choose to sell the rental, it has a nice little worksheet that we can do to calculate the capital gains. Okay. And I'll show you that here in a second once we get the other information in. All right. So, we have, again, I like to use for the main building, I like to use the address of the property, okay? Help if they own more than one, it helps me keep track of whose is whose. Asset type, again, we're gonna have our little list come down. This is what's gonna help us get our, our convention or our um, uh, you know, useful life. Um, again, there's a lot of them in here. You know, if any of you guys are doing your own dairy farms or raising cotton or fruits or horses or whatever, or, live on an Indian reservation. There's a bunch of good ones in there. But this is a real property residential rental. So we're gonna put that in as our asset type. We are going to put in that it was purchased and they started renting it on June 1st, 2002. Okay, so June 1st, 2002. Uh, great little thing on the depreciation. Once you do that, it pulls down a little tree to give you a choices of the property it goes to. And then we have to say that this is a residential rental. Uh, we can enter in the value that we paid for it, um, or a cost, or a basis. Um, you see there are line 1B here that we're going to put in there an area for our uh, land value. So we're going to put that in there. Now, business use. This is where we put in our 50%. This is a double. So that being said, we can see down here our basis for depreciation now is half of the basis less the land value, half of that, that's what we're gonna depreciate. Now, we know that we're gonna do the makers here 27 and a half, and for rentals, we're gonna be on mid-month convention, all right? Now, for those of you that don't like red, this is gonna be one of your homework assignments because six is the current previous depreciate or current pre depreciation. Eight is next year's depreciation. You are going to calculate seven for me for homework. And that means you have to calculate the depreciation for each year going back to 2002. It's not bad because we got a very similar, the makers uh, uh, DB straight lines. So we're, we're gonna, it's not gonna be too bad, but I do want you to calculate that, okay? And then obviously, because of the type of asset this is, it's not eligible for a special depreciation or section 179, okay? So that's the way we get that in there. Now, as I was telling you, I'm gonna come back to this in a second here, and this is where I wanna do this. So if I go to my asset worksheet, now I find out that I'm going to sell that rental property, it takes me to another work part of the worksheet, and you can see here, I can put in all the information about selling the property. And what it'll do for me is if I sell it at the at last month of the year, I can see here and then I sell it for 100,000, which means half of it would be the, the um, because half of it's personal residence, the other half is uh, my uh, selling price. So I have that, you can see, it calculates for me the gain based on the recaptured appreciation. But in this case, Line eight, the depreciation recapture is not correct because I have not calculated or entered prior depreciation, okay? All right, so we'll take those out of here. All right, and we're gonna go back to our depreciation sheet. All right, so you can navigate between them up here with the little gray boxes, okay? Now, I have two more things. The roof was replaced in this year and the driveway was also replaced. Okay, in 2014. So I'm gonna go here, and I like, if I'm working on a sheet and I need another one, 
I like to go up to a little white tab that says copy asset worksheet, copy the current worksheet. It gives me a brand new one. And in this case, I have a roof. All right. Um, on this case, I have my choices. If we go down here, we have leasehold improvements for residential. I have my roof was 8435. Whoops, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself. Was done on 8 9 2007. We have it applies to our woodlawn property. All right, residential rental. Again, the repairs were 8435. However, and I have had people argue this with me. If you have a double and you have a roof, you get to take half of it. I don't care if you live in the bottom half and the tenant lives in the top half and the roof is right above their apartment. That's still a shared roof, even though it's not over your apartment. So don't allow somebody to argue that point, okay? So we got 50%. We have mid-month. And again, work for you to do. I'm going to have you calculate that prior depreciation for those years going back to 2007. Last thing I have is I have a driveway that was replaced in 2014. So I have my driveway. Oops. I have my asset type as, hmm, is that a leasehold improvement? What would that be? What do we have here? Ah, we have some land improvements, okay? And if we look, there's that 15 years for us, okay? Remember we had from our chart in the workbook, we need to get that 15 years. So we got 910, 2014. It went to the Woodland property. Again, we have 5766, and we had 50% because it is a shared driveway. And we again are gonna use mid-month for these on these real estate uh, rental income properties, okay? And again, a little homework for you, prior depreciation. I know you're gonna hate me having to do all this depreciation hand calculation, but like I said, it's not uncommon for you to end up with somebody that has that, okay? All right, so we have that, okay? All right, so that's everything on our rental. Now, we go back to our Schedule E, okay? And we go down here, and the only thing left is, did you actively participate? And we're gonna say yes, okay? So that that income comes over there for us. All right. Okay, so we have that, okay? So we have everything on there. We take a look at our 1040, we got our wages, we got our interest, we got our rental income, gets us to our AGI. You know, we didn't have any adjustments to income, nobody was a teacher. Um, took the standard deduction. Um, you know, we can take and make sure that our real estate taxes that we had on the house, um, grab my statement here. It was okay, and we got our property taxes in there. And again, with them taking half of it, you know, we're not anywhere near the 12,000 standard deductions, so we're going to take the standard deduction for the two of them. Um, you know, 24,000 is going to be the federal, so okay. All right, so we have that. We have our education credit. So we can see here, tax, withholding. All right, so they had payments, so they owe money. And again, that was something I picked up right away on because of how low the whole withholding was on that 54,000, okay? Now, because they're on hard times, they decided not to get health insurance, okay? So, we are gonna to say to them that they did not have it through the marketplace, but we're gonna get them an exemption. And so I'm gonna talk about the form there, okay? Now, if I have an exemption and I can account for all 12 months, okay, I want to realize that that means that 
they had coverage or an exemption and we accounted for all 12 months. If we can only get the exemption for part of the year, we'll use this one. If they didn't have insurance at all, then we'd have this one, okay? So we have all of that, okay? So if we look, I have an exemption now, and on my tree, there's an 8965. Remember I talked about marketplace and I showed you that hardship, exe uh, um, hardship exemption form? That's where we would place that form, okay? Now, this is where we'd use it. So in this case, I'm gonna say that Thomas and I would have to list all of the uh, people in the household that are asking for insurance or the exemption. But we have uh, Thomas, we have his uh, number, social security number. Oh. And then here, because we need an exempt certificate number that's issued by the government, since we mailed in with a uh, separate, but at the same time, we mailed in that hardship form to Kentucky and e-filed the return, we can put the word pending in there. And this will allow the return to go through and uh, not impact their refund. And they'll eventually meet up with each other, okay? So that's how that would look, all right? Now, this is what I was talking about, household income. Is my income below my filing threshold? Well, it's not, so I can't take it there, all right? Now, if I don't take the one at the top, I might be able to take the one at the bottom. And again, fell on hard times. So again, we would have to list everybody here uh, that's on the return. Okay, and I'm gonna say it was unaffordable for the entire year, okay, or I might have said, well, he switched jobs and middle part of the year, I'm asking for the exemption for the three months that he was in the waiting period, okay? So you can see how that works on that, all right? So we have that as far as, uh, you know, what they would have, okay? All right, so we have all of that. Now, they're not doing the exemptions. Okay. Okay, so we have that. Okay. Now, in this case, we're going to just go here and we're going to say that they didn't have the exemption. Okay, and we're gonna say that mom and dad did not have insurance the entire year, but they did take care of the kids and they paid for Child Health Plus, okay? So in this case, when we check those boxes, all right, it lights up page two of our ACA worksheet, and we can see that they have a penalty of $1,390, okay? So that is the penalty for mom and dad not having insurance. Now, on this line here, we got to include dependent income. So Herman is actually working while he's going to graduate school and made $10,000, okay? So this is where we put his income on the return, all right? Does a little bit different for the 2.5%, but you can see that the other one was still greater, so we're gonna have that $1,300.90, okay? All right, so that's how the, the penalty is calculated. Now, they had insurance, okay? And for mom and dad, it was through the marketplace, okay? So they have insurance through the marketplace. So again, another form pops up over here, 8962. All right, this is where we calculate. Um, again, we talked about income there. We have that they lived in the 48 states, okay? All right. And this part, we're gonna always answer no, because uh, you know the, this is if somebody got married and it's, it's a rare situation. If you get where you're gonna have to allocate, please call me, okay? It's one of the ones. Now, they had insurance all 12 months through the marketplace. Um, their annual premiums will say that they to them six hundred seventy two hundred dollars. Okay, 
is what they pay. Uh, second lowest cost over for them is going to be, uh, let's see, we're gonna say uh, six, uh, eight. We're gonna say is 9,600, okay? So based on that, their annual premium tax credit, their assistance that they should be able to get is this amount, the 4961, okay? That's how much they should pay and this is how much they should get. So if they only got $3,000 of advanced premium tax credit, you can see here down on the bottom, what they didn't get in the marketplace, they're gonna get back, okay? If they got, um, six, whoops, 6,000, okay? That means that they have to pay back because they had excess. Say that they got 7,000, okay? Now, you can see here that they should have paid back 2361, but because of their poverty level, they only have to pay back 1500. Okay. And everything is driven by that, that uh, premium tax credit. Okay. All right. So what we have on there with that. Okay. All right. So that's a little bit about the health insurance. We've done rentals. Okay. All right. So we're going to do that. All right. So we're there. Okay. All right. So that's about the rentals. Any questions on anything? I know I threw a lot at you today, and I tried to have a problem where we could do a little review, do a little health care, things like that, okay? All right, so any questions? Any questions? Uh, let's see, Tony, is there a penalty to me for health insurance? There is still the shared responsibility uh, penalty or payment or whatever you want to call it. It's really a tax. Um, but, yes, for 2018, yes, we're still required. Otherwise, you'll pay a penalty on 2018 uh, for not having health insurance. 2019, it goes away. But for 2018, we still have it. Okay. All right. Any other questions right now? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. We're going to All right, and as I promised, I was uh, here at the end for those that weren't here at the outset. Um, but as I talked about, um, my early Christmas gift to you is the fact that uh, I'm going to give you the areas of focus for the final. Um, you know, everybody's doing great. What we're going to do with the uh, set session next Saturday is, uh, and I'll send a reminder when I send out the answers to some of these problems and stuff. We have just a little bit of material I'm going to cover, um, not a lot of pressing subjects, but just a little bit. Uh, but next Saturday, um, you know, if you have topics uh, that you'd like me to do or things that you'd like to have me cover in tax-wise, I know that for a lot of people, everybody's got a great grasp of the tax code and the tax law, and, and you're phenomenal there. Uh, but sometimes you just fight the software a little bit. If there's areas with that and things like that that you want me to uh, to help out and take and put in there, um, I'd be happy to do that um, and focus on those um, so we can do that. Um, but, you know, uh, let me know um, so that we can decide what we want to do. Uh, send, you know, lest, uh, um, you know, next uh, Saturday is the 15th, um, kind of our last session, if you will, before the final. So I want to make sure. But like I said, um, you know, this is my uh, early Christmas gift. Um, I guess uh, it was uh, two days ago was St. Nick's Day. I can't remember. I get a little daily reminder thing on my, uh, my um, one of my uh, uh, emails that says about what the national day is. And I think it was St. Nick's Day or St. Nicholas Day. So that, uh, you know, sorry I didn't get this to you on that day, but this is my gift to you. And as I talked about, you know, focus on your wages. Um, you know, your W-2s, uh, entering those wages. Uh, focus on your Schedule C's for business income. Uh, focus on your capital gains. I have a feeling that we probably will see the sale of a stock. Uh, focus on rental income that we just went through. 
And again, because we're doing rental income and we're doing business income, make sure you take a look at depreciation. Uh, review your uh, adjustments to income section, uh, especially as they relate to business with that self-employment tax. Um, you know, we're probably, um, you know, this is a family that demics that's probably not going to itemize, uh, but make sure you realize what your itemized deductions on where those go. Um, uh, they do have a son that is in college, so I would take a look at your education credits, okay? Um, and talk about self-employment tax. And I guess one of the kids is under 17 for the child tax credit. So make sure we focus on those areas, okay? So that's my gift to you. I would focus on those areas because there's probably a very, very good chance that things I just brought up about the Demick family uh, would probably be on the final. Uh, we had a question about TaxWise, about the login, the password. If you get that, enter yes, and then type the password you've been using three times. It'll allow you to reuse the password and reset it for the window. It's just the little nuance of the student version that we use for TaxWise. But uh, if you do get that where it's warning you that your password is about to expire, uh, again, use the password that you've been using and type it three times, and it'll just keep using the same password and reset that for you. Okay. All right. All right, everybody. Uh, good session. Like I said, next week, um, you know, I'm going to put this video together. Um, I'll send out some of the answers to the problems. Um, again, um, you know, it's tough on the, um, the whole um, uh, depreciation uh, parts with everybody saying, okay, this is the answer. Because you might look at it and say, you know what, I'm going to take the Section 179. I'm going to take that special depreciation. I'm going to do whatever it may be, you know, on this situation. So there can be a lot of little nuances. So, you know, some of these I have had emails back says, I didn't get what you got, or I didn't get this, or I didn't get that. Um, you know, again, special depreciation, there's a lot of little nuances as to how, how you handle your depreciation with either a Section 179 or special depreciation, okay? Um, so I'll send those out, uh, talk about some problems. Like I said, one thing I note that I'm going to have you do is uh, make sure that you calculate that prior depreciation. I'm uh, just making a note to myself here for that. Okay. All right. And then, like I said, uh, for those of you that are in the area, um, I know some people have some uh, that, you know, aren't here today and, and uh, some other instances. I've had emails for some of you that, you know, basically have said that uh, I'm, I'm going to have some difficulties. Um, you know, uh, with um, um, getting um, uh, available for the final or they have something going on or medical or family, obviously we're in the holidays. Um, but, you know, if I need to schedule something with you, but I'm going to send out some times and if it is all possible, I would love to have you come here to do the final. Um, I'd love to see that you work on it uh, so I get a sense because that's the one thing that is a little bit of the downfall. Um, we can exchange information. You can watch me do things. You can watch them but I can't see you do a return. And uh, I love the fact that, um, you know, with my classes, a lot of times I can pick on somebody and make them interview me as a tax client and, and see them uh, use the software. And sometimes, like I said, that's where people fight. So, all right. Um, please go over the clergy worksheet. Um, if I had another two hours, I would go over the clergy worksheet. Um, that's one that, uh, that we use, I gave you that information. We don't have a problem during the basic class because it does kind of, that's an actually a, a copy of something from one our advanced. But if you do work in the office, one of the practice problems, there is a clergy so that your supervisor can help you go through it. Um, it is a very confusing thing. Um, I know for, I do several clergy, so I've gotten used to it. Um, but the, the clergy worksheet uh, for you on there, there's a lot of little nuances there. And uh, that's one that is best um, not explained, but to do with you hands-on. And that's why I'm going to reserve that for, for if you're in the office, that we have you do that um, in the um, uh, uh, office on the software so that the supervisor can go through it with you. Because uh, there's a lot of little nuances there with that. But that's where we try to create that cheat sheet for you to have uh, so that uh, when you have a clergy one, and, and, and again, work with somebody. Uh, first few clergies that I did, I can remember I was like, okay, wow. Um, and then, you know, I was lucky enough that I had a supervisor um, that worked alongside me that, you know, um, 
Well, I take that back. First clergy I did, I did on my own with somebody because I somebody gave me that sheet nice enough. And uh, first year I worked for EG Tax, I was put in as a supervisor in office and I had somebody and I was able to muddle through it a little bit. It took me about an hour, but we got through it. So, all right. But uh, yes, uh, uh, Jim, I'll make sure that uh, I make note on that with the clergy um, that we have something. Um, I'd be a good video for me to do just on a standalone and maybe I can send out to everybody. But uh, for sake of time right now, um, I'm sure that uh, that would be one that would be better served that way. Okay. All right, everybody. Again, great session. I appreciate everybody taking the time. And, you know, I'm sure that all of you are in the heat of the battle for your Christmas shopping. Um, if you haven't got it done, you know, I know that Black Friday's gone. You know, Small Business Saturday's gone. Um, Cyber Week is gone. But I'm sure there's still bargains to be had out there. And uh, like we keep talking about on the radio show with Esther, if uh, you get a chance to go to WBEN AM 930 and listen, um, she's been pounding home. You know, she's making a list, checking it twice, you know, and she's making sure that, uh, you know, everybody knows what they need to get done for the end of the tax year. Um, so, you know, make sure that if you got that on your Christmas list that you make sure you get it crossed off too, okay? Don't want anybody to have any shockers when they come come have their taxes or you do your own taxes or you do somebody else's taxes at the end of the year, make sure you talk to everybody. Okay. All right. So great session again. Um, I talked about that. I get the emails out, get the answers out, get the video out. Uh, we're in good shape. There won't be a lot of homework again this uh, week. Um, Cause like I said, we're kind of winding down a little bit on the beef potatoes, but uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, again, uh, we'll make sure this is up on the thing and I'll send a link. And, uh, you know, uh, make sure that you get information back to me, uh, especially the work forms if you're going to plan to work, um, and then when you'd like to schedule your final. Have a good afternoon.